covering here over the last several months, I think it's probably been several months here now, that we've been talking about living an overcoming life. In other words, there is no scriptural reason, period, for a child of God to live underneath any kind of bondage. If you've given your life unto Christ, the Bible said he has delivered you, he has freed you, he has uh, liberated you. Therefore, bondage should not show up and should not be dominating our lives. And if it is, it's because we've allowed it to, all right? And so we've spent some time, we've gone through scriptures and after scripture, after scripture, proving to you that out of the word of God that, that we have not been called to bondage, but that we have been delivered. And we've looked at many of things concerning that, and I don't have time to go back through everything. But today I want to kind of possibly, if, I, if the Holy Spirit says so, bring it to some closure here. And I want to talk today about some practical things. Amen. We've talked about some spiritual stuff and, and, and getting our minds renewed and understanding that God his will for us is to be free, but then after we understand that, there's a spiritual side that we need to be working on, but then there are some things in the natural that you should be doing as well. All right? So let's look at some of this stuff in the natural, uh, and, and, it's, and, and, and I'm going to give you a, a, a template that you can work from, but, you know, everything that we preach here is for you to take back home and for the Holy Spirit to tailor it to fit your life. See, my job is not to just, to, my job is not to cross every T and dot every I in your life. That's not what I'm here for. My job is here to present you with the information that you can take back home and get with the Holy Spirit, and He will show you how to cross the T's and dot the I's in your life. See, because I'm not God, He is. And see, you may not tell me everything, but He already knows everything. Yeah. Therefore, I may be sitting here trying to figure out how, how to make this work to fix your life, and I may make some mistakes, but I know if you take the Word of God and you go home and you talk to the Holy Spirit about it, it will be precise, precisely the thing that you need to do, and then it will be your responsibility to, to do it, all right? So, we're going to start here this morning in Romans chapter 6. And let's look and let's see here. about some of these practical things that we need to do. Now, I want to read verse 10. I'm going to start at verse 10. And I want to read it from the Amplified Bible this morning, if that's okay. Verse 10 says, For by the death he died, talking about Jesus, by the death that he died, he died to sin, ending his relationship to it once and for all. So that means that there is a place that we can come to where we can end our relationship with sin once and for all. It, 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 it can be done. And it has. And the life that he lives, he is living to God in unbroken fellowship with him. Verse 11. Even so. Now notice this. Even so means just like what we just got through reading. Just like Jesus, even so, just like Jesus. This is what we should be doing. Consider yourself also dead to sin and your relationship to it broken. So this is telling me now that if you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, just like he ended his relationship with sin, we can end ours, and we should. I would even go as far as to say, as far as God's concerned, it's been ended. Jesus was the answer to sin. Amen. Then he says here, even so, consider yourself also dead to sin and your relationship to it broken, but alive to God, living in unbroken fellowship with him in Christ Jesus. So our goal is to live in unbroken fellowship with God through Jesus. That's the goal. That's what we're after. Why did you get saved? See, this is what I understand. People come out of the world and get saved and then still want to act like they're living in the world in the church. Then if you wanted to continue to live a world sinful life, you shouldn't have came in here. 
So I assume that if you come in here, you're tired of what you were doing out there. So this is what he's saying here. Hey, once you come over on God's side, what you're saying is, I am fed up with the old previous life, and I'm ending my relationship with that, and I am now getting ready to start developing a new one with you. That's what he says here. Verse 12. Let not sin, therefore, rule as king in your mortal, short-lived, perishable bodies to make you yield to its cravings and to be subject to the lust, its lusts and its passions. Now notice what he said here. Since your connection to sin has been broken, stop allowing it to reign or have authority in your life. All right? If the Bible says you can stop it, you have the authority to stop it. Because if the Bible told you to stop something that you really couldn't stop, then it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a fair statement. That'd be like me telling, my, my, uh, telling a two-year-old, go down to the store and pick up a gallon of milk and come back. And they get mad because they couldn't do it. They didn't have the necessary uh, wherewithal to be able to do that. So God is not saying to you, telling you to do something that you can do. So he says, now you end your relationship with this. Stop letting it rule in your life. Stop letting it be king in your life. Now, how do we let it rule and be king in our lives? Well, the next verse says, neither yield your members. It says, do not continue to offer yourself, your body members and faculties to sin as instruments and tools of wickedness, but offer and yield yourself to God as though you have been raised from the dead uh, to this perpetual life and your bodily members and faculty to God, presenting them as implements of righteousness. Stop taking and allowing sin. Stop taking your body and practicing sin. You stop doing it. That tells me that you have the ability to stop doing it. Now, I don't care what bondage we may be talking about this morning. See, because we have a way of putting things in classifications and we feel, well, if it's not this, it's not that bad. Bondage is bondage. Doesn't matter what it is. You have no right to sit here and say, because you smoke a pack of cigarettes and they're smoking uh, and they're shooting up drugs that you're not as bad as them. Bondage is bondage. What you talking about? What's the difference? This is on God's outside is bondage. Same thing if you are if, if every penny you get you at the mall shopping, that's bondage. It keep, it's keeping you broke. See, so don't classify and put these classifications on where the bondage is. God says get rid of all of them. You have the authority to get rid of all of them, okay? Now, how do you do that? Stop yielding yourself to them and stop allowing them to be king in your life. So that means that we're going to have to do some things in the natural to alleviate this problem. Now, we, you, you're going to have to start, start with the Word of God. We've already covered that. But we're talking about what do we do practically now in the physical realm that's going to help us get to where God said we can get to, which is living this, this, this life, this glorious life that he has given to us, free from bondage. That's what we're going to look at today. So there's three things that I want, to look, want us to look at. Number one, we found in these scriptures, it says, stop yielding yourself. So my question to you would be, number one, what are you yielding to? What are you yielding to? Because it's not what has control over you, it's what are you yielding to? Because whatever you yield to, that's where the control is given. So what are you yielding to is number one. Number two, we're going to look at this unbroken fellowship uh, unto God peace. First of all, let's identify what are we yielding to. Then we're going to talk about this unbroken fellowship piece. And then the last uh, piece that we're going to talk about is discipline ourselves through the word. These three things will set anyone free that will walk in them and live them. Folks, this is not a fantasy. 
it works for those that will work it. It's not something, well, I heard something good at church, and I gave my life to Christ, and I got saved, and everything is going to be all right. No, it's not. Unless you do something about what's wrong. There are tons of people that love God with all of their heart and would do anything and will die and go to heaven, but they're living days of hell here upon this earth simply because they have yet to take the word of God and change their life. This is why I don't, this is why I, I, I change, you know, when you start growing in God, you start to see things differently. And this is why you can't be the judge of whether someone went to heaven or hell or not. That's why you can't judge that. Because you have folks that have gotten saved, but no one taught them how to live. And so all they're doing is behave, their behaviors are still governed by an old mindset, although their heart loves God. Well, God's not going to throw them people away because they didn't learn any better. The problem then is because for the people who know better and keep doing the same thing. Now we got an issue to talk about. And this is what the Bible here is here for, to, to train us on how to live. So let's look at this first one. What are you yielded to? Let's look at 1 Corinthians. Chapter 10. Now I'm going to tell you right now. To come out of any level of bondage that's become a stronghold in your life, you are, you are going to have to put forth some Christian energy and put some force up against it to get free. Yeah. It's just that simple, folks. Now, it's not as hard as trying to do it without God, but I am going to tell you, it, there is some working required. Now, notice what it says here, verse 23 from my Amplified Bible. Paul saying here, all things are legitimate permissible, and we are free to do anything we please. Notice, you can do whatever you want to do. You can. You can get up right now and leave this church and drive down the street and rob the store if that's what you want to do. It's not right, but you can do it. You can get up out of here right now and say, you know what, I'm done with this, and go and buy you a fifth of NJ and sit and get just as drunk as you can, and, and, and you can do it. You can do it. He says, you, you, it's, 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 it's permissible. You can do it. But notice what he went on to say, but not all things are helpful, expedient, profitable, and wholesome. All things are legitimate, but not all things are constructive to character, to the edifying, and uh, to this edifying and, and to this spiritual life. So what is he saying here? Although as a grown adult, you can do just about whatever you want to do, not everything that you want to do is going to be helpful to you. In other words, you're going to have to set some boundaries in your life. And here is the problem why people stay in bondage is because they don't set boundaries in their lives, first of all, to keep them from going into places that they shouldn't, and then they don't set the boundaries to keep them away from places that they were going. You have to put some boundaries in place. Now, what do you mean by putting some boundaries in place? Well, I, I want to keep it as practical as I can make it this morning. So I'm going to use simple stuff that we can understand. If I know I've had a problem in my life of drinking, that is a bondage that I'm trying to come out of. I've got the word on it. I'm, I'm following God on it. That's, that's great. But I'm also going to have to set some boundaries in place. And the boundaries that I'm going to have to set in place are going to have to be, number one, I need to stay out of places where there's alcohol. Number one. Number two, I'm going to have to stay away from people that like to drink. That's number two. Number three, I'm going to have to find me some accountability partners so that when I'm getting ready to have a relapse of some kind, I have somebody that's going to be able to help me. I need some boundaries in my life. 
But see, you don't want to put boundaries in your life because that, that, that disciplines the flesh, and the flesh don't want that. See, when a person really truly is ready to be done, whatever they're ready to be done with, nobody has to uh, micromanage their life. They, they put these boundaries in place because they, they want to be free. Well, I'll just go join the AA. The AA, AA, AA group is great. That's a good start. But they can't help you get free if you're not going to utilize the techniques and the skills that they give you. And the techniques and the skills that they're given are boundaries to put in your life. You've got to have some boundaries, folks. Quit talking about you. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm getting better. And, you, and, 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 and I'm, and I'm going to stop using drugs. You still sit at the crack house. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Well, I don't need to go down there and talk to those people. I can do this by myself. Well, if you could have did it by yourself, it had been done by now. It's not going to happen. There is the other problem. We allow the devil to get in your ear and to convince you that, you know, I don't want to be embarrassed and I don't want nobody to know my business. See, that's what keeps you in bondage. Because you listen to the lies of the devil. Everybody in here needs somebody else's help at some point in life. Nobody's an item to themselves. Nobody gets to where they're going to get to in life by themselves. You've got to have some help. So Paul says, hey, you can do whatever you want to do, but not all things are going to be constructed to build a good character within you to the edifying of this Christian life. Let's take it a step further. Let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's add this in there. Verse 12, he says, Everything is permissible, allowable, and lawful for me, but not all things are helpful, good for me to do, expedient or profitable when considered with other things. Everything is lawful for me, but notice this, but I will not become a slave to anything or brought under the bondage of its power. Here's the next thing. For some strange reason, people seem to think that they can handle stuff. I can handle this. Everybody that's addicted to whatever they're addicted to started out talking about they could handle it. Everybody. I don't care if it's the, if it's the, the person with the pornography on the computer. When they started down that road, they said, oh, I, I can handle this. I'll just watch this on, this on this television or computer, and I'm not really, you know. And, and, and I, 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 let, me, let me back up. Everything starts, I may be getting ahead of myself, but I, I, I'm just going to go with the Holy Spirit on this. Okay. Everything, every addiction, every bondage that you may be in starts out with a suggestion from Satan. All of it. It's where it starts. Nothing's wrong with that. You can handle that. Just do a little bit. Nobody got to know. Suggestion from Satan that you have to receive. And everybody, let's, let's, just take, let's just take the child molester, for instance. The child molester didn't start out as a child molester. It started out with a thought of looking at little kids on a computer, which was harmless to them. Oh, this is harmless. Just, you know, I just for some reason, I don't know why, I just, they know it's wrong, but there's a, a gratification to that flesh. It's a stimulus, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, how could I put it? It causes them to have this pleasurable sensation. Now, just because you have a pleasurable sensation doesn't mean whatever the thing that's pleasuring you is right. And you know when it's not. Come on, as a, as a fully functioning, grown, capable adult, you know darn gone well when it's not right. But it gratifies that flesh. It makes you feel good. And it's not harming anybody. I'm just sitting here looking at the computer. Ain't nobody even here with me. And I'm not bothering anybody. I'm not thinking about, at this point, touching nobody's little kids or none of that stuff. I'm just sitting here looking at the computer. What could be harm? harm what's, what's the problem with that? See? Little suggestions. So what do you do? You start to feed that, that bondage in that area. You start to feed it. Now, I'm talking about this, but this will go for anything. I don't care what it is. This is how it starts, and this is how it grows. 
And so you keep looking. Now, notice, Paul says, but I'm not going to be controlled by anything. At first, you were controlled. You thought you were controlling it. But the more you fed it, the stronger it got. And now it's going from me just watching little children on a computer to now that person wants to now look at little kids physically. Now, they still might not be touching anybody yet, but they're now there. They find themselves manipulating situations and things now to be in the presence to be able to, do, to, to see what they were looking at on the computer. Now they're feeding it on another level now. They've gone from drinking milk on the computer, now they're eating, you know, some meat now. Watch the progression of it. And before they know it, they're physically now wanting to put their hands on somebody. Where did it start? A thought. It happens the same, with thing, same way with any drug, any alcohol. It happens the same thing with spending. It happens the same. I don't care what the, the bondage is. It all follows the same progression. A suggestion that is fed over time produces the bondage. It's just that simple, folks. This is why when it first comes up and you know it's not right, the Bible says do what? Casting down every imagination and every high thing that tries to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. The moment things show up in your life, quit talking about what you can handle. Where is the boundary going to be? No, Lord, uh, uh, no devil, this is not right and I'm not thinking about it. Nobody just wakes up one morning and commits adultery on their spouse. That don't happen. It happens over time. Then you get the full manifestation of it after you fed that thing for a while. But when the thought came, you should have set, shut it, shut it, should have shut it down. That should have been the first, that, that's the first boundary. Hey, nope, that's not right. I'm going to shut that thing down and I'm going to shut it down now clip. It's done. And I'm not looking at another kid on this computer. Now, here's why it's, here's why so many people fail to come out. Because the devil tells you, if I tell somebody that I have a problem with looking at little kids on a computer, they're going to look at me funny. So you stay secret. And the devil wants you to stay in the secret behind it. He wants you to stay in the dark with it. Why? Because you're not going to get any help there. You're going to keep feeding that thing because you're not strong enough. Because if you were strong enough, you would have shut it down already. You're not strong enough to shut it down on your own. Care what the bondage is. You're going to need some help. You're going to need some help. You find somebody. You ask the Lord. You, you ask the Lord to send you somebody. Put somebody in my life. Send me to somebody that I know that I can be confident in the fact that they're not going to judge me and they're not going to take my business and spread it all across the city. But they're going to help me come out of here. Amen. God has those kind of people in the body of Christ. So real, real people. So he says, I'm not going to let anything control me. I'm going to be in control. I'm going to master everything. Remember it says, it says, stop yielding yourself. Stop letting sin reign as king in your life. I'm not going to let any of this become king in my life. Why? Because I'm going to set some boundaries in place. Just because you're saved don't make you immune to, prob to, 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 to the problems and stuff out there, folks. If you water around the pig pen, stink will get on you. It's just that simple. I don't care who you are. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Just, just read a few things here to you. Boundaries. And while I'm getting ready to read this out of the King James Bible, if somebody can find it for me in the uh, Common English Bible, the Common English Bible. And we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and, and find, and, and find uh, verse uh, 26, 27. But I want to start with verse 25 out of here. It says, every man that striveth 
for the mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, least that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now, there's a lot of you know, old school English in that. Let, let's, who, who, who has in that common English, in the common English version? Let me, let me read it from there. Now, now listen to, to, to this. Um, it says, so now this is how I run, not without a clear goal in sight. So number one, we need to have, when, we, when we're setting boundaries up in our lives, what, are, what is the goal? What are we trying to accomplish? What are we trying to avoid? Clear goals. Then he says here, I fight like a boxer in the ring, not like someone who's shadow boxing. In other words, I'm not wasting time here. A boxer trains on purpose. I mean, if you ever pay attention to what they do, they do it on purpose. They set a routine. They set a schedule. They set boundaries. They don't do certain things. They don't go certain places. They don't eat certain things. They do their training on purpose. Why? Because they have an, an, a goal in mind. And it's what Paul is saying here. What is your goal? Where are you trying to get? Then that should dictate to how you train yourself, how you live, the boundaries you put in place, the people you go around, the places that you go. Uh-oh, I lost it. I lost, I lost it. Let me finish this. Then he goes on, he says here, Rather, I'm landing punches on my own body and subduing it like a slave. I do this to be sure that, my, that I myself won't be disqualified after preaching to others. Now, notice what he says. I, he's, notice he says, I discipline my own flesh. I do what's not comfortable so that I can obtain my goal. Now, once you've already developed an appetite for something, your flesh wants to keep doing it, but you're going to have to set things in place that are going to make your flesh uncomfortable until it's trained. If you know you a spender, stay out of the mall. I'm a discipline myself. And if I don't think that I have the wherewithal to stay out of the mall, then I'm going to make my money very hard to get to. Get rid of them credit cards. See, you can put things in place that's going to help you to, to reach whatever the goal is that you're trying to reach. But see, if you are daydreaming, shadow boxing, lying to yourself, you perpetually stay in the same spot. That's why an alcoholic that, that, that won't do what I'm saying stays an alcoholic. A drug addict that won't do what I'm saying stays a drug addict. And any other bondage that we want to talk about. If you know you, you don't, you've de developed an appetite for having sex with someone that's not your, your spouse, then I don't care what you say. Don't tell me that you, got this, that you don't develop this thing. And, and, now, and that's a strong development there. Don't tell me you're going to be comfortable sitting up in the movie theater wrapped all up watching a movie with all these sexual scenes in it and you're going to be fine when it's time to go home. You're lying to yourself. So you, 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 you set your own self up for failure when you should have had things in place. Can we go out to the movies? Yeah, we can go out to the movies. But you're going to drive your car and I'm going to drive my car. And when the movie is over, with, guess what we're going to do? You're going to get in your car and go your way, and I don't care how bad my flesh is, is crying out, I'm in my car going my way. See, what are you doing? I'm setting boundaries in place to help keep me out of there. Amen. I had a friend. I tried to help her, but she didn't listen. She's going to come tell me one time, tell us what well, she was talking to a group of us. And she said, well... You know, she wasn't married. And she was like, you know, I'm believing God for my spouse and whatever, whatever. Okay, great. 
So she comes in this, to work one day. She's talking about uh, her boyfriend at the time. It was his birthday. And so she got to talking, and you know, sometimes people when they're talking, they tell you more than they want to tell. So she started telling us stuff about how she, was, her, she had uh, rented this, this suite, and, and she was going to cook her boyfriend breakfast that, for, for breakfast that morning. And I'm just sitting there listening, and I'm thinking to myself, this is foolish. This is foolishness. Because you're saying that you're getting ready to go to a hotel suite with your boyfriend, and all you're going to do is cook breakfast, and you're putting yourself in a position where you're already compromised, and you haven't even got there yet. <laughs> and you know me, I, you know me, I'm, I'm just not that one to bite my tongue. So I said, so what you, I said, so what you said is after you, when y'all wake up in the morning, you're going to cook breakfast. That's what you're really saying. No, that's not what I said. I said, no, I said, no, I know that's not what you said, but I said, I'm telling you what you're saying is when y'all wake up in the morning, you're going to cook him breakfast. Because if that's the case, you could just took him on down the hops. Because, come on, let's just be for real. <laughs> See, you, you've already lost the battle because the boundary isn't there. And it's amazing to me how people think. And see, we sit here and laugh. That just didn't sound right. But we do the same thing in other areas of our lives and don't even realize that we did it. You know that was the car payment money. Why is it in your purse or in your wallet at the mall? And you, and you think you're not going to spend it? That's the same thing as I'm going to cook breakfast in the morning. Same thing. Well, it's New Year's. Now, you're an alcoholic, a recovering alcoholic. It's New Year's. You know, I could go down to there to the, to the church because, you know, they're having a New Year's celebration. But, you know, my boys asked me to go out with them. And, you know, I don't never do anything with them. Now, I know it's the devil. Now, all year, the devil ain't said nothing to you about going out with your boys. But now, New Year's. I ain't never going out. Man. I don't never get to go out with my boys. You know, I'm going to go hang out with them. I ain't got to drink. I ain't going to drink nothing. It's New Year's. Come on. What party did you go to on New Year's and it wasn't a, a 15,000 bottles of something sitting somewhere for you to drink? And then January 2nd, when you wake up, you wonder what happened. You set yourself up for failure because you didn't let the boundaries stay in place. See, what I'm trying to get you to see is, is unless you set boundaries in your life, then you're always going to be yielding to things that are controlling you. You better learn what you, where the boundaries need to be set, and that's the Holy Spirit to help you and set them. And keep them set. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, God's not going to twist your arm and keep you out of the liquor store. It's not going to do that. God's not going to bend your arm behind your back and make you not go to somebody's bed that's not your uh, spouse's bed. He's not going to do that. But what he will do is he will constantly remind you in your ear, now, hey, keep that boundary in place, but you're going to have to discipline that flesh and overcome that flesh through the power of your spirit and tell it, no, we're not doing that. And quit telling people how grown you are. I'm grown. Yeah, you grown and in bondage. When you're supposed to be free. Yeah, you grown. That's what Paul says. You grown. But you are a slave to whatever you addicted to. Now, Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 15. Hopefully this is simple. I'm trying to make it as simple as I can make it. And this is why, you know, I know people probably get frustrated and get mad at me because I'm at, after I don't talk to you one or two, two times, I'm, I'm done. I don't want to talk no more. I really, I don't. I mean, I'm, are you a pastor? That's all right. I, I'm not the only pastor to feel this way. I probably just want to be just, just brave enough to say it. I get tired of talking to you. <laughs> um, and, and let me just tell you why. Because if you're not going to do none of the stuff that we're talking about, I'm wasting my time. I can, that hour I could have spent doing something else. Come on, either you're going to do it or you're not going to do it. If you're not going to do it, then don't ask nobody for any help. You're wasting their time. Don't come in. And here's another thing. I'm, I'm, I promise I'm not going to get on my soapbox. <laughs> but here's another thing. Don't come to asking for help and all the time you're doing all the talking. Shut up. Because 
if you knew how to get yourself out of it, you've been out of it by now. Shut up. You don't know. Listen. You stay well, here. The word of God says, yeah, I know that. But yeah, I know that. But see, there's the problem. Your butt's still in the way. That's the problem. Get it out of the way and you can get free. It's just ridiculous. That's what Sis Loper told me. I went there talking to Sis Loper one time, crying, boo-hooing, and she said, see, see, she was old school. That's why I said, if, if people talk to you old school, y'all probably be, most folks would fold up now. Yeah. I'm standing there talking to her, boo-hooing, crying my heart out. I'm talking to this, the, 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 the pastor's wife, and you think she's going to be all, like, oh, baby, it's going to be all right, baby. She didn't do none of that. She stepped back off me and she said, shut up. <laughs> Quit all that whining. Now what you gonna do? I was shocked. <laughs> I came down here to the church. These people ain't got no love. She was right. Shut up. You, the crying ain't gonna change nothing. What are you willing to do? See, we're too busy waiting for people to pamper us instead of somebody tell you the darn gun truth about where you are. That's why you stuck. Because if you want to get out, you can get out. Don't sit here and tell me, don't, anyone that's truly born again will never be able to stand in my face and tell me I just can't. You lying. Because if what you're saying is Satan more powerful than God, that's a lie. You, you, I, you can go on, get on out of here with that because I ain't believing none of that. Now, either, you, either you're born again or you're not. If you're saved, then the power to overcome greater is he that's in you than any demon and devil that's in this world trying to hold you in anything. Now, so that's not the issue. The issue is you really don't want to be free yet. Because when you really want to be free, then you will, I don't care if they told me that I got to, that I got to take myself, duct tape myself to a chair to be free. If that's what I had to do to be free and I really want to be free, get the duct tape and let's get the wrapping. Because I'm telling you right now, I'm coming out of here. See, when you get serious about wanting to get free, you will get free. It's people that aren't serious yet. Now, notice what it says here, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22. Where there is no counsel, it's Amplified Bible, purposes are frustrated. But with many counselors, they are accomplished. What, what is that saying to you? You're going to need some help. If all you're trying to do is overcome based on what you can do and what you know, you're not going to get too far. You're going to be frustrated. Why? Because that's why that's how you got where you are now. You're going to need somebody that's able to help you. This is why you don't come to the counseling session talking. You come listening. I come to get sound counsel. I come to get help. Me and Quantrell would go down to Bishop Lopernim's house talking to him about our marriage for the first five years. We was, man, I haven't met a person yet whose marriage was worse than me and Quantrell's. Nobody. I don't care what you've come and tell me. We were so bad, they finally told us one time, Sister Loper backed away from the table, and Bishop Loper crossed his arms, and they looked, looked at us, and they said, I'm going to tell you something. Don't come back down here no more. Don't come back no more. Don't come back. <laughs> It's the pastor. They finally got to the place with us. Don't come back. Now, you know you bad when the pastor told you we're done. Don't come back here no more. You're both hard-headed and you don't want to listen. Do what you do. That's what he said. See, that's what I'm talking about. Old school, the old school folks, they hurt your feelings. But it was the truth. We come to the council session to get help, but we down there telling them. No, you can't do that. I need help. I'm talking, let me, God, who are you going to put in my life who knows what to do? And I'm going to tell you right now, as the pastor of Works of Faith Ministries, I don't know everything. I ain't going to tell you I do. I can pray, get an answer, but I don't know everything. Some things I haven't experienced, so I don't understand what you're going through. But then there are people that God can direct you to that understands how that addiction works, that understands the pressure that's on you, understands what you're going to have to do to come out of there because they don't been there, done it, and, 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 and succeeded. So don't get frustrated with me because he, I, I lead you to somebody else. I'm going to lead you to somebody that we trust and somebody that God tells me to lead you to. Your job is, is to listen and follow the instruction. Bow 
boundaries. Folks, you have to set boundaries. All right, let's talk to all the other folks that sitting in here. Well, I ain't got none of those problems. I'm doing good. You still need some boundaries so that you can keep doing good. But I ain't never, I ain't never cheated on my husband. I ain't never cheated on my wife. Well, you better make sure that you set the word of God, set some boundaries and make sure it stay that way. You're not immune. We live a disciplined life. That's what the word discipleship means, to be a disciple. A disciplined life. We don't live like everybody else. That old crap that Nike put on that thing, just do it, that's a lie. You better not just do it. You better ask the Holy Spirit if that's something that you should be doing. There's another boundary. How many of us even take the time? Well, Lord, you know what? Should I even get involved with this? Well, let me just go ahead and step on a few more toes because we don't talk about drugs and sex and money. <laughs> Let's talk about your cookies and cupcakes and, and pies. <laughs> Bondage. If you can't put it down and walk away, I can't wonder why I can't lose no weight. It's because of cookies and cupcakes and pies talk to you all night. <laughs> and you get up out of the bed and go on bail. <laughs> Let's just be honest. You land up in the bed, it's 9.30. <laughs> you know you should be asleep. And Ben and Jerry's is talking to you. And before you know it, you done got up, put some shoes on your feet, car keys in your hand, and you, and, and, and you sitting now, you sitting in the bed with, a, with, with some Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> talking about it, and, 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 and who's, now, who's controlling that situation? Because you told Ben and Jerry's for the first 35 minutes, I ain't, nah, I ain't going, nah, I ain't going. Nah, I'm not going, nah. Nah, I'm not going. No, nah, I'm not going. And now you're eating Ben and Jerry's because you don't win. It's bondage. It's not, now, mind you, it's not as, well, it could be because sugar kill you just as fast as anything else, but, but still. What am I trying to say? It all started out, where, what, where did Ben and Jerry thought come from? It was a thought, right? It started as a thought. You could have told it no and went on the bed. But your flesh is used to eating Ben and Jerry's. So you obeyed it. So at that particular moment, Ben and Jerry's became master. And you know it's master when they get you up out your bed and got you putting clothes on. <laughs> and some of you same folks laughing. I better not even say that, Lord. I'm not going to say it. Mm -mm -mm. All right. Unbroken fellowship. Nope, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to keep that one to myself. Because mm -mm -mm. I may hurt somebody's feelings this morning. I don't want to do that. Ephesians chapter 4. Now, let's talk about this unbroken fellowship here. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 says this. This I say, therefore, and testified in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as the Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds. So in other words, it says, stop living like, the, like you lived before you got saved. He said that there's a difference now. Then it goes on and it says here, now, now what did, hold, how did you get this to the Holy Spirit? Let me make sure I'm getting ready to say this right. Verse 21. If so, now notice it says, once again, verse 17, this for I say unto you, and testify of the Lord, that you henceforth or don't walk as the Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. If so be that you have heard him, and have been taught by him, talking about Jesus or the word, as the truth is in Jesus. So if you've been, if you've heard the word and you've been taught by the word, because the word is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation or the former lifestyle of that old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And put on a new man, which uh, after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So that tells you right there, if I'm going to live in unbroken fellowship, I'm going to have to make the decision that I'm going to keep, I'm going to set my mind on God. 
See, when, when the devil's trying to give you thoughts about everything else, you cast those thoughts down and you go back to the word. Set my mind on God. I'm going to think about this life that I'm living. How many of you spend time consciously thinking about how you're living? What does it mean to be a Christian to you? Do you spend time thinking about, am I, am I, am I getting ready to please God? Am I, am I really, Lord, am I? I know that I'm acceptable in your sight, but is, is, is the behavior that I'm displaying acceptable? See, because God accepts you because you're his child. But he don't accept the behavior of, of, of all of his children. You know that's true. You you love all you love your children, but you don't accept all of their behavior, do you? No. God's the same way. Lord, it is, is my be I know you love me, but does my behavior today reflect who I am and who you are in me? Did now I'm gonna tell you something. Here's a thought. You a saved man or a saved woman. All right? You don't gave your life to Christ. You saved now. But you, 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 you're still sleeping around with your boyfriend and your girlfriend. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself the question, I'm a child of God. Did this behavior that I just demonstrated, did that help this person or hurt that person? I'm supposed to be representing God here. Now, I'm trying to give you stuff that's easy for you to see. I'm supposed to be representing God. How am I going to help God help you and we keep getting up out of the same bed together? Yeah. You know, God is not going to throw you away because you was in the bed. No, he, you're his child. But that behavior is holding somebody else in bondage. And, and you and the devil are working on this person together. And he's supposed to be the person that God is using to bring them out. Now you take that and you plug any situation into it. Is what you're getting ready to do going to help somebody? Sometimes the, the boundary and the thing that you set and the fellowship that you have with God, sometimes it's going to be burden, burdensome on you so that you can be a benefit to somebody else. Here's an example of that. When I first got saved, we went to a church down on 39th, on 39th Street. And the church was on 39th and Agnes, and they moved across the street. But uh, back then, I was a heavy pop drinker. And so the nearest grocery store was a little ways away up on 35th Street. You had to drive for a little while or walk for a little while if you didn't have a car. It was, it was, it was, it was you know, and I, and I needed to be back quick because I had to be at the church and I'm doing stuff. There's a little liquor store down on 39th and Prospect. Now, I went in there a couple of times and got me a two liter of pop. You know, they put it in a little brown paper bag and you come on out and you're going where you're going. And I did it a couple of times until one day I went in and the Holy Spirit said to me, now, what if one of the saints saw you come out here with this brown bag? And I said to him, so what? It's a, it's a bottle of pop. That's exactly what I said. So what? I don't care. But then he says, this thought came back in my mind. What if one of the, I'm a deacon in church. What if one of the saints in here struggling with alcohol, see you come out here with this brown paper bag, have no idea what's in it, looks like a 40-ounce bottle. Yeah. And they start beginning to think, well, if the deacon can, can drink, why can't I? So what did I have to start doing? Going all the way over on 35th Street just to get a bottle of pop. Now, was I bringing alcohol to the store? No. But it was, how is my behavior affecting the people around me? So I want to be a blessing to everybody because I'm living in fellowship with God. And I know if I'm living in fellowship with God, God is after the souls of men. So I don't want to be a pawn in Satan's uh, arsenal to cause somebody else to stumble and fall. So I take myself several, uh, five or six, seven, eight, nine minutes away just to get a bottle of pop and come back. Or I do without it. What are you willing to do? Because I'm about loving God. Because that's where my mindset is. Let's, let's look at a few more things. <laughs> I want to get this finished before I leave. Colossians chapter 3. 
What are you willing to do, folks? See, I, we can keep on, I, I, I can keep on preaching and preaching and preaching about what the Word of God says about bondage, but at some point, you're going to have to do something. At some point, you're going to have to do some practical stuff. And we've already talked about those boundaries. At some point, you're going to put some boundaries in place if you're going to come, if you're going to be with God and walk with God the way and be the example you're supposed to be. All right. Verse 1. From the Amplified Bible. If then you have been risen with Christ to this new life, thus sharing his resurrection from the dead. Now that means something. Sharing his resurrection from the dead means something. It means that we also partake in the power that comes out of that resurrection. It's power. Is what he's talking about here. Aim at and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God and where your seat is too. Set your mind on what's in heaven and keep your mind set on that. Well, how do I do that with this book? I put my, my eyes in here and I let this dictate how I think about what I'm doing. I don't, let, I don't let my flesh govern it. I don't let what society say. I don't even let what I think control it. What did the book say about it? Then that's what I should be setting my mind on. And it says, and keep it set there. Set your mind and keep it set on what's above, the higher things and not on the things of this earth. For as far as this world is concerned, you have died to it. And your new life, this life in, that's hidden in Christ and in God, verse 4, uh, where Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also uh, appear with him in the uh, uh, splendor of his glory. Verse 5. So kill, deaden, deprive of power the evil desires lurking in your members, those animal impulses, and all that is earthly in you that employs in sins, and then it gives you all these different things that they are. So, so, so now notice. Set your mind on what's above and kill, deprive of power, those, des those desires that's trying to control your flesh. Simply stating, you can overcome something you keep participating in. Wow. It's impossible. You want to stop smoking cigarettes? Quit smoking, quit buying them to smoke. Well, I just can't control my flesh. That's a lie. It may be uncomfortable, but you can do it. Stop participating in it. Deprive it of its power to live. I've never in my life seen so many people that are tied down to stuff but keep feeding the thing that they're tied down to and think you're going to come out. You're not going to come out of there unless you make your mind up that I am in fellowship with God. He has given me his power to be free. Therefore, this thing is not more powerful than I am. I'm not going to keep sleeping around with people and I know I'm not supposed to. I'm not going to keep getting high and I know it's killing me. I'm not going to do this and I'm not going to do that. I don't care what it is. It's not more powerful than you. It's not. But if you're going to keep playing around with it, I won't, I, I, you know, I just go hang out with him, but I won't drink. You're playing around with it. Here's one. I'm just going to give me one, you know, this is the new thing for the Christian folks now. I'm just going to give me a non-alcoholic beer. That's stupid. That's stupid. You know why that's stupid? Because you're still practicing the behavior. And how long is it going to be before you use this non-alcoholic beer, enough pressure get on you, and I'm going to get a real one? Here's the other one they come out with. So you, you gonna, you, you, you're you tired of paying $15 for a pack of cigarettes, you're just going to get the little, I'm going to get this thing over here that's not, the, I don't even know what it's called, but the little fake cigarette thing. You're still playing around the same, that same behavior. And now that I doubt the, the research is out, that's, that's doing just as much damage to the other as, as, as the pack of cigarettes. 
Here's another one. Well, they got this new marijuana. It really ain't marijuana. It ain't really weed, but it's... See, you're still playing around with stuff. You're keeping it on life support. When the Bible says, kill it. Kill it. Get rid of it. Well, Pastor, that's hard. No, it's not. It's hard because you don't really want to get rid of it. If, I, if, if, if it was a, say for instance, we took and we put a, a can on a, on, a, on, a, on a flame for a while and let that can get hot, and then you, you, know, you, you reach for somebody, you, somebody, you put your hand out, you reach for somebody, you grab a hot can, how long does it take for you to get rid of it? Not that long, does it? Does it? Because you what, immediately you feel an effect from it. Just as fast as you can drop that can, you can drop anything else if you stand in the power of God. It can be done. You can drop it. The problem is, is that you have yet to see the effect of it as real. Now, I didn't go. Quantrell went. And she came back and she told me about the exhibit that they had down there about the, about the body. And I've talked to different people. They got an exhibit down at, I think it's still here, down at Union Station about the physical body. And she said she went down there, and I've heard other people at work talking about it, and they show you the effects of different things that it has on your physical body. You know, your body's a resilient thing. God made this thing to live. But the problem is, is that people are killing it fast as it's trying to live. If you really knew what that stuff was doing to your insides, you probably wouldn't do it anymore. At least you have something, at least maybe your mind may at least say, well, maybe I, maybe I do need to think about stopping this. But see, the problem is, is you, you think you, I'm grown, I can handle it. I'm grown, I can handle it, it's killing you. I'm grown, I can handle it, got folks in prison. Folks, hey, I come out of the era, I grew up in the era where crack cocaine came, first came out, and I saw what it did. First-hand experience. Live right in the center of it. And I watched folks prior to it, folks that had wonderful jobs, educated people, people that you would never think they would do something like this. But they were already on doing things that they, could, they thought they could handle. And then this showed up. And I watched this wipe lives, families out, homes out, people that went from educated people to doing things that are unspeakable. Because a drug had that much power over them that they had yielded to. Here's why God is saying get rid of it. Because you have no idea if it gets strong enough where it will take you. You have no idea. Why play around with stuff, folks? So it says you got to keep your mind set on it and then keep your mind set on what's above and then kill and deaden the evil desires that's putting flesh pressure on your flesh. Kill it. How do you do that? This is what the boundaries are for. This is what the counsel, the help is for. If you can't do it on your own, check yourself into a facility and get some help. But do something. Sitting around whining about it is not going to change anything. Now, let's look at this last place. And I don't have time to go through all this, so I'm just going to kind of talk you through. I mean, you can go home and look at them on your own. Psalms 119. And you can look these verses up 9 through 11 for yourself. The last one that we say we're going to talk about is how to... Take the word of God, let the word of God discipline you. Psalms 119, verse 9 through 11 basically comes down to this fact. He says, the word of God have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. If you're not going to put the word, keep your mind set on the word, put the word in there, you may do, but you, you may not ever get off of it. You may not ever break free. But if, I, I, if I'm going to break free, if you're going to break free, you're going to do it through the word and let the word cause there to be discipline. Then you look at Romans, the eighth chapter, and it tells you why. 
It says because a carnal minded man, the man that has no word in his heart, basically can't be controlled. And where there is no word, your flesh is in control. Regardless of what you want to say about it, where there is no word, your flesh is in control. Well, Pastor, I went to church. That don't mean there's word in you. Folks go to church all day long, and then you see them doing all kind of dumb stuff. Folks, there are people that went to church, and you saw them, and then you look later on that evening, they're making these posts, and they got all doing all kind of stuff. Then how the heck they doing that? Because there's no word in there. They just went to church. So it says, and then, so it goes on and tells you there, and it says, hey, where, where there's no word, that, that the carnal mind, it says it's an in, in, enmity against God. It says it's against God. Can't obey God, will never obey God. And it goes on down through there, and it tells you the difference between the two. James chapter 1 says this in, in verse 21 and, and, and 22. It says that you need to allow the engrafted word of God to save your soul. The Amplified Bible says the word has been implanted in your heart. You let what's in your heart, the word of God, if it's in your heart, let that control how you think, which will entail control the boundaries of your life, which will entail break you free from whatever you, you, you're in bondage to. But then it goes on, that was verse 21, I believe, and verse 22 says, but, but after, you, if, if for it to happen, you're going to have to become a doer of the word and not just a hearer, only deceiving yourself. You came to church and heard the word, but didn't plan on doing anything with it. You deceived. Just coming to church don't free people. It helps. But you're going to have to go home and do what you heard. If you're tired of being slapped, and someone tells you that this is what you do, and you won't be slapped no more, and you keep on doing what you was doing at first and keep getting slapped, then whose fault was it? I'm going to tell you right now, don't come talk to me. If you are getting physically abused by your spouse and you come talk to me, my first word to you is going to be, you need to get up out of the house and you need to get up out of that house now. But I love them. They ain't got nothing to do with what you need to get out of the house. You're going to love them from somewhere else. God is not requiring you to stay in some house where you're getting physically abused. You may end up dead. Well, Pastor, how are you going to tell? I ain't told you. To, I'm not telling you to divorce your husband. I'm telling you to get yourself to some safety. Because you can't do nothing if you're dead. Well, I love him. And, I, and I'll just keep praying. All right. While you're getting slapped, keep on praying. Because, uh, hey, because that's you praying. He ain't praying. She ain't praying, they slapping you. Your prayer can work just as good from down the street as it could if you stayed in the house. Amen. Well, that's another story. If you're not going to do the word, if you're not going to, if you come to get some good counseling, somebody gives you some good Christian counseling, and you're not going to go home and practice it, you wasted your time. You're going to stay stuck where you are. Because yeah. if you had enough information to come out on your own, you've been out by now. You got to do what you're hearing, folks. It's not enough just to hear. You got to do it. You want to get your fun, your money right? Then you find some folks that have some discipline when it comes to money and listen and then do it. You want to come off of drugs? You find some folks that God has delivered from drugs that know what they're talking about, know what they're doing, and you listen to what they're saying and you do it. You want to stop cheating on your wife or cheating on your husband? Then you find the word of God and find you some accountability partners and y'all link up and you do what you need to do. But you can't continue to sit around talking about how bad you feel, how wrong it is, and, and Lord, if you could just help me. He's helping you, but when are you going to help yourself? You got to do it. Here's the how. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says the word of God is sharp, powerful, able to divide out. It's able to divide things out. Spirit, soul, 
Join us in more. In other words, the Word of God is able to divide this thing down the line, and the Word of God is able to set what's right on the right side and what's wrong on the wrong side. And if you will let the Word of God train you, it will teach you and discipline you to do what's right and to resist what's wrong. You can train your flesh to do this. You can train your body that I'm not going to eat any more of that sugar. You can train your body that I'm not, you know, I train, you know, the, I went to the doctor. The doctor told me, boy, you know, you're going to have to quit drinking that pop. You know, the, the diabetes is trying to get on you. Your high blood pressure is going up. I came home and I told the Lord, you've been talking to me about pop for years. But guess what? Pop don't run me. So I put pop out of my life. Now, though, I had tried to do it all the time, but I kept playing with it. Kept, kept playing with it, kept buying it. The moment I made up my mind and got the word to say, look, Doug, gun it, devil, you're not killing me, that pop got up and walked out of my life and it ain't been back since. I've tried to drink one or two every, since then, and, and the taste is even wrong now in my mouth. I don't want it. Why? I've trained my flesh to reject it. Now, there are other areas, and I'm working on ice cream now. <laughs> but we're going to get that under control, too. But uh, you can teach your flesh to reject it, and it won't want it anymore. There are people that were alcoholics that they, that they're, they, the smell of it now does something to it. They like, just can't stand alcohol. Why? They've trained, they've taken the word of God, and they've trained themselves. You can do the same. And then you can go look at uh, St. John chapter 8, verse 30 through 32, where Jesus was teaching. It says, and, 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 the, and the, uh, the people that were out there heard him. They believed what they heard. Jesus preached and said they heard it and believed it. If that was enough, that would have been the end of the story. But Jesus himself says that wasn't enough, basically, because the very next verse says, if you continue in the word. In other words, if you, whatever you hear, sit here this morning, I believe this. Well, okay, believe is not enough. If you will continue in what you say you believe, then are you my disciple. In other words, then the word will cause you to become disciplined. And the truth then will make you free. But where there is no word, there's no discipline. Because if you're trying to use world tactics to discipline world problems, then you're on the same plane. You want to get above world, so I got to go into the realm of the spirit. I got to go to where the word is, because that now is going to exert more power. And then I'm going to start praying it, reading it, meditating it, listening for the voice of the spirit of God. Because I didn't say this when I was talking about boundaries. You don't need to be the one determining the boundaries because a lot of times your flesh would do something easy that, you, that, that, that can be easily broken. You listen to the Holy Spirit. He will tell you where to put the boundaries and how to put them in there because when he set them up, they're set up to be unbroken. And they're going to be very uncomfortable at first, but just stick with it until your flesh is trained. The name of the game is training, folks. Training. You're training your flesh. You're training this body to not want to continue to do what it used to do before we got saved. Because all of us brought things with us over here. Now we got to unlearn those behaviors. Just because you got born again, your physical body didn't get born again. It still has the appetite for what you were doing before you got saved. You got to go back in with the word of God and kill it and retrain it. And it can be done. Now, I close with this. One of my things was music. I love rap music. And Tupac and Ice Cube was my favorite. Until Tupac almost got me put in prison. Because every morning on my way to school, bright and early morning, I popped that track in there. All I want to be was a gangster. I think that's the name of it, but... Folks, it was back then. Y'all know the song I'm talking about. And I listened to that, sung it, and listened to that, sung it, until all of a sudden I started trying to be a little game. No, boy, I don't know nothing about good. That ain't even in my makeup. But this music, 
and all the other foolishness music. And while y'all sitting there laughing at me about my rap music, all you lonely-hearted folks up in here listening to all that, that lonely, pitiful R&B about some man don't love you and that all that the same thing. <laughs> y'all laughing at me. Wondering why y'all sitting there can't get Bubba out your mind while you listen to the song you listen to when you met Bubba. <laughs> That's why you can't get rid of Bubba. But anyway, I won't go into that. So, so I got saved. My flesh is used to listening to rap music. Well, I can't bring Tupac and Ice Cube and the Ghetto Boys and all that. I can't bring them over here with me. So what am I going to do? I got a decision to make. Some, some time for some discipline. Get this flesh under control. Holy Spirit said, gather up every CD and tape you have. Well, it was tapes. It wasn't even CDs. Gather every cassette you have, throw it in the trash. Whew, I don't know if there's some money in some of this. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I got some money here. <laughs> now I got a choice. I'm either going to be a doer of the word, or I'm going to just, no, I just put them in my trunk and won't listen to them anymore. So I said, okay, I'll get rid of them. Here come the devil. But don't throw them away. Just give them to somebody. Just give them to somebody. Well, if it wasn't no good for me. Sold it to somebody else. Hey, I'm getting ready to sow corruption in somebody else's life. I'm going to reap. Nah, devil, you lied. Nah. Trash they went. Every last one of them. Trash. Listen to something new. What am I doing? I'm training my flesh to not want rap music anymore. Turn it off. And now I'm to the point now, I, don't, I, I can't stand it. I don't even want to hear it. It, it irritates me. It's irritating to, 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 even, cause, to, to even listen to any of it. I'm like, how do I listen to this stuff anymore? But I don't beat up on people because I used to be there. I don't even like, I'm just going to be honest. I mean, it's, it's, I don't kick against it because I, it would be wrong for me to do it. But because of where I, because of what I, how I'm built, I don't even want to go, I don't even want to go to the concert. I don't want to be around the concert. I don't want to be in the room with it. I don't want to, I don't want it around me, period. Now, some people can listen to it and it's all good. It's all fine. That's, that's you. I'm not trying to put me on you, but what I'm trying to say, this is what I had to do to discipline me. What do you have to do to discipline you? What are you willing to do? What are you willing to change? How bad do you want to be free in the area that you're bound in? How bad do you want to be out of there? Then you're going to take what we've been talking about over the last few months and you're going to start practicing it. And then you're going to do what we talked about today. Set, let the Holy Spirit take the word of God and you and him work to set boundaries in your life that keeps you free. Quit fooling yourself. Because if you don't do what we talked about today, and may, hopefully I helped you some. Hopefully the Holy Spirit helped you figure out what I was trying to get to. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you do not just make some decisions to do things differently, you'll be in the exact same place you are now next year. And the year after, and the year after, and the year after. And you'll die and go to heaven, but you lived your whole entire life bound in that area. And you didn't have to. All right? So, Father, we thank you tonight, this morning for your word. And hopefully it was simple. Hopefully it was plain. Let it renew minds. Let it change lives. Make us free. Make us better. In Jesus' name, amen.